If there's one level in Halo Combat Evolved which handles battling the Flood better than any other, I think it's probably two betrayals. The Flood can be a very irritating adversary at the best of times, but there's enough variety throughout the mission that it doesn't suffer quite as much from some of the issues other levels surrounding it struggle at times to deal with. On the other hand, it's also a lengthy backwards retread of Assault on the Control Room, which often was quite repetitive at times, and I think it's fair to say that the same problems are evident in two betrayals. With that being the case, I think it will be quite an interesting one to examine further. Before we do, here's a brief primer on what happened leading up to two betrayals. After the Covenant attacked the human ship, the Pillar of Autumn, Spartan, Master Chief and Cortana, the AI he's sworn to protect, crash land on a nearby ring world. Rescuing the Autumn's captain, Jacob Keyes, from the Covenant ship, the Truth and Reconciliation, soon after, Keyes says he believes the Covenant think Halo is a weapon, and sends the pair to locate its control room while he leads a squad in search of a weapons cache. Finding a map leading to the installation's control room, Chief and Cortana fight their way to it. Cortana then realises that the weapons cache Keyes is heading for isn't what it seems, and that something far worse is housed there instead. Master Chief races to stop the captain, but he's too late. Keyes' squad had already been ambushed by a terrifying new enemy known as the Flood. As the Flood begin to tear their way through humans and Covenant alike, the monitor of Installation 04, 343 Guilty Spark, teleports Chief to Halo's library, and after narrowly surviving the Flood onslaught, he's able to secure the act activation index needed to stop them from spreading any further. Returning to Halo's control room, however, there's a twist, as Cortana reveals that Halo itself is the failsafe against the Flood, and is designed to wipe out their food, all sentient life in the galaxy, which is where we all pick things up. Halo doesn't kill Flood, it kills their food. Humans, Covenant, whatever. We're all equally edible. The only way to stop the Flood is to starve them to death. And that's exactly what Halo is designed to do. Wipe the galaxy clean of all sentient life. With Guilty Spark now your enemy, your first task is to take down a gaggle of angry sentinels. There's some pretty bread and butter game design here in that you begin the level wielding a plasma pistol, plasma weapons being especially effective against the sentinels. Prior to two betrayals, you'll have only fought alongside them during the end of 343 Guilty Spark and throughout the library, but you'll be taking on a lot of them moving forwards, so here developer Bungie lends a helping hand so you can quickly ascertain how to deal with them most effectively. Cortana informs Chief that the best course of action will be to detonate the Pillar of Autumn's fusion reactors to blow up the ring, and as you head outside, the Truth and Reconciliation suite kicks in, and Cortana explains how you can delay Guilty Spark, your objective for this mission. The machinery in these canyons are Halo's primary firing mechanisms. They consist of three phase pulse generators that amplify Halo's signal and allow it to fire deep into space. The power levels are enormous, I can't even begin to calculate the pulse's range. So, if we damage or destroy these generators, the monitor will need to repair them before Halo can be used. That should buy us some time. And since making your way to the bottom of this area is pretty similar to when you made your way up it at the end of Assault on the Control Room, I want to take a moment to touch on the music during this level. It's great. Two Betrayals includes some of my favourite tracks in the game. Indeed, it might be the strongest mission in terms of its track selection, and they're all used at just the right moment. My personal favourite is towards its conclusion, as you clamber up a hill into a darkened valley, with the Covenant and Flood locking horns ahead of you as Under Cover of Night kicks in, one of my favourite video game tracks of all time, and there's a ton of other great examples littered throughout. Reaching the bottom, you'll have to take out more Covenant and a Wraith before you hop in a Banshee for the first time ever in the Halo series, and head to the first of the three Phase Pulse generators, which you're forced to walk into to take out, removing your shield in the process. The battles immediately after you destroy each of them are fairly tricky on higher difficulties, and can be a real source of frustration. Personally, I'd not be overly unhappy if they weren't there. During this first one, for example, if you only have human weapons to hand as you fight the Sentinels which are appear, you might have a pretty tough time. 
An extended period spent indoors is required to get to the next generator, beginning with a few quite simple skirmishes against the Covenant. If you've watched my previous piece covering Assault on the Control Room, which you can check by clicking the card on screen now, you'll know that I'm not a huge fan of these sections. They consist of circular rooms, lots and lots of circular rooms, and bridges, and the level design is generally very uninspiring. However, replaying two betrayals for this video, something sprung to mind I'd actually never thought of before, despite having played Halo Combat Evolved a frankly absurd number of times. The back half of Halo Combat Evolved is packed full of repetition, whether that's the imposing hallways of the library, the Covenant ship you explore for the majority of keys, the remains of the Pillar of Autumn featured during the Moor, or, of course, most of Two Betrayals. But Two Betrayals is the only one during which you go through a previous level backwards for pretty much its entire runtime, bar some detours to destroy the generators. And that got me thinking. In the past, I'd always just figured Bungie were running low on development time, and so the repeated environments during Halo's back half were a way of ensuring the game was ready in time for its release date. That could well be the case, but it also makes me wonder whether Two Betrayals backtracking was planned earlier on in development rather than being a necessity in order to get the game out the door. If that is what happened, then the circular rooms and bridges begin to make much more sense. They absolutely are still a chore to get through, but if Bungie had designed Assault on the Control Room with the express idea that you'd also tackle it later backwards, then these sort of environments are perfect in a way due to their symmetry, which means whichever direction you enter them from, they still work as combat arenas. It doesn't necessarily make them any more enjoyable, but thinking of it that way, I can at least sort of see the logic behind them. The other thing worth noting during this part of the level is that there's a nice ramping up of the Flood's presence over time to help give the impression of them quickly sweeping through vast areas of the ring. You first encounter a few of them alongside a larger group of Covenant, followed by both factions duking it out on parallel bridges. The next area is home to more Flood than Covenant. I feel particularly sorry for these elites who get sandwiched between them and Master Chief, after which point you encounter only Flood for the final bridge and circular rooms. It quickly becomes clear that they're beginning to overwhelm the Covenant. Arriving back outside, you'll likely be relieved to hear that it's time to head to the next pulse generator, and I reckon much of Two Betrayals from this point onwards is mustard. It's now nighttime on the ring, with little to cut through the gloom except for gunfire and explosions. There's Covenant everywhere, there's Flood everywhere, and there's more vehicles than you can shake a stick at. You're even given the opportunity to indulge in some aerial combat. And after destroying the second generator, it seems as if Cortana's plan to blow up the Autumn has hit a slight stumbling block. I've located the Pillar of Autumn. She put down 1,200 kilometers up spin. Energy readings show her fusion reactors are still powered up. The systems on the Pillar of Autumn have fail-safes even I can't override without authorization from the captain. We'll need to find him, or his neural implants, to start the fusion core detonation. But before you can begin your search for keys, there's still one more generator left to lay waste to, and to get there, you have to fly through this tunnel. I really don't like this tunnel. Flood-wielding rocket launchers are something of a bugbear for a lot of Halo fans, myself included, and because I doggedly refused to get out my Banshee when entering it, I was killed quite a few times. Why they have to be so bloody accurate, I don't know, and this probably isn't the example most will think of first, but during my most recent playthrough, this was the one occasion where they really had my number. They are way too accurate, there's way too many of them in two betrayals, some placed at ridiculously close quarters, and honestly, I wish they'd go away. You'll next have to cross a bridge filled partially with, you guessed it, some more rocket flood, and given that I'm moaning about the weaponry certain enemies are equipped with, I do also have to give Bungie some credit. They leave tons of guns all over the place for you to pick up, and there's always human and covenant weapons lying around after encounters due to the multi-faction nature of the mission. If the flood's explosive capabilities can at times be a bit much, then at least you're given ample opportunity to tailor your own loadout and have some fun during the only level in Halo's campaign which features every weapon in the game. So much firepower being on offer is pretty handy too, as the next few encounters, including the one I highlighted towards the start of this video, remain some of my favourites to this day. I remember vividly being blown away by the battle unfolding in front of me, as Banshees circle overhead while Covenant and Flood duke it out at ground level. The earlier multi-faction encounter which began the hunt for the second generator, and these which come later, are some of my favourites in the entire game. The Covenant-Flood bridge sequences and indoor sections 
missions in two betrayals aren't too bad either, and there are some decent similar encounters in the missions which follow, but these outdoor brawls have always been, for me, one of Halo's real highlights. There is still some iffy design here and there. During the first encounter, for example, the flood hidden away to the side of you who usually arrive late to mess up your day are a bit of a cheeky addition by Bungie, but from the moment I step outside for the last time right through to reaching the third generator, I'm always enthralled. Everything feels moody and climactic, and you're involved in combat at a scale unlike anything prior, witnessing the onslaught of an enemy which suddenly seems like much more of a threat than even the Covenant. Back in 2001, I'd seen nothing like it on console or PC. It was a very special experience. My tail has also been tucked firmly between my legs when writing much of this script, as I think I may have made a mistake. In my video ranking Halo Combat Evolves missions, click the card on screen now to check it out, I put two betrayals in 8th place and Assault on the Control Room in 3rd. While I still think Assault on the Control Room is a great level, I actually enjoyed replaying two betrayals just as much, if not more. While it does suffer from a lot of the same issues, the biggest being repetition and length, I found myself far less disinterested playing through two betrayals two or three times than I did at certain points doing the same with Assault on the Control Room. I think the very variation in encounters and the multi-faction elements are enough that I was never as bored as I was when playing through its daytime sibling, which often nearly put me to sleep. Battered and bruised after an extended period of combat, you'll finally reach the last generator, where you'll have to take down one final herd of sentinels, after which two betrayals concludes as you begin the hunt for keys. I learned how to tap into the grid when I was in the control center. Unfortunately, each jump requires a rather consequential expenditure of energy. Something tells me I'm not gonna like this. But I'm pretty sure I can pull it from your suit without permanently damaging your shields. Needless to say, I think we should only try this once. Do it. I always like to finish with a quick word or two on each level's anniversary edition, and this video will be no different. Most of my thoughts here very much mirror what I've said before. The Forerunner architecture is hideously over-designed, there are too many particle effects, and it just doesn't manage to capture the spirit of the original particularly well at all. As with other missions like the Silent Cartographer, the outdoor sections are generally better. However, there's a huge but. All the outdoor environments are really, really bright. It's one of the worst changes in the entire Anniversary Edition and completely changes to Betrayal's tone and atmosphere. If you plan to play this level again, please, I beg you, stick to the original. When all is said and done, it turns out I like two betrayals quite a bit more than I thought I did. Much like most of Halo Combat Evolved's second half, there are major issues on this occasion with length, repetition, and blooming rocket flood, but the amazing outdoor sequences almost entirely make up for them. That's not going to be the case for everyone, and I can still understand why many dislike it with a burning passion. It is a slog, there's no doubt about it. But if you're able to put those problems, and the fact it's a retread of Assault on the Control Room to one side, and enjoy the uniquely large-scale Flood vs Covenant encounters within it, you might still end up having a very good time indeed. Thanks for watching the video, boys, girls and Spartans. If you had a good time, do consider liking, subscribing and letting me know your thoughts, and hopefully I'll see you all again soon.